All right. So a couple little technical problems today. One being, um, I'm they upgraded the iClicker software, and I was on tech support for about an hour, and they still don't have it working. So we're not going to be able to use the iClickers today. I have a whole series of questions that I wanted to ask because I like to survey students and find out about it, uh, which would account for a lot of iClicker questions. We'll just move those on to Wednesday. Okay. So uh, a couple of things. One, this is genetics, PCB 3063. Everybody in the right place? Whether you want to be or not, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, the other is, <laughs> since I haven't used a lot of this since in a few months, I have a little light wireless control. And it turns out that battery's dead. So I'm having all kinds of little tech issues, but this is not the norm. Okay. So, anybody recognize this animal? Your biology majors? Drosophila. That's, well, one, it's, it's the organism that I make a living with. And I always find it interesting that on the student evaluations, there's always at least a few students who go, he talked about Drosophila genetics too much. Well, we do that because there's about 150 years worth of data there. Does that look like a normal Drosophila? What's different about it? Why is it fluorescent? Hmm? Okay. It's pretty close. This is a transgenic animal. It's been genetically modified with a protein from jellyfish called the green fluorescent protein. And we can genetically manipulate this animal, put the DNA into its genome, and genetically control when the gene's expressed, and that's why is fluorescing this way. Just using this as a little bit of an introduction to give you some feel of where the state of the art is today. Okay. I suspect that most of you, probably the genetics background you've had so far is from general biology. Is that right? You, you, you did a lot of Mendelian genetics, right? Okay. We'll talk about how Mendel, out of all those critically important experiments, really gave us three key ideas, and we'll cover all of that in one lecture uh, next week. Monday. Uh, you probably did meiosis, right? You think you understand it? Turns out you don't. <laughs> but if you understand meiosis, then everything that Mendel taught us, you can see how it comes from the behavior of the chromosomes rather than simply being probabilistic numbers. So I want you to understand this and learn the genetics from the mechanistic side, not from what's the probability you know, the equivalent, if they still do this, you know, what's the probability of pulling a red bean bag out of a box kind of thing? Okay. You got that. You know about sex-linked inheritance. Uh, I get to talk about that, make it a little bit personal since I'm colorblind. And after that, that's probably about as much... Did you cover anything else? Is that about as much genetics? Come on, I need somebody just... Like, I'm up here, okay? Well, that'll cover our first three lectures. And we got 23 lectures. So there's a lot of new stuff that you're going to be introduced to. Um, but you'll see this as we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit as we go. Okay. Let's just get the mechanics out of the way. So for those of you who haven't met me, don't know who I am, I'm Dr. Benninger. It's hard to imagine, but I'm actually one of the senior faculty now. I'm starting my 26th year here. My daughter was about six months old when we came here from California, and she's now in graduate school up at UCF. So for most of you, I've been here longer than most of you have been alive. Okay, so I've been doing this for a little while. There are my office hours, except they're wrong. Look on the syllabus. I got a colleague over in criminal justice, and every year we go, we're going to make shirts that say, read the syllabus, and we're all going to wear those into class the first day. And we always forget. Okay, my office hours will actually be 12.30 to 2 o'clock on Tuesday and Thursday, okay, but it's in the syllabus. That's my phone number, you can leave, that's my office number, you can leave a voicemail, but I don't know what it is, it's like the glare from the window, I can't always see that little light on there, and also the recording quality of the voicemail is horrible, so many times I don't, I try to return phone calls, please speak clearly. I usually, please call me back. My number is 561-333. What are you doing? What the hell is that? You play it again, you hear the same thing. 
So, but the best way to contact me is through email. Um, I try very hard to answer all of the emails that come in, or I will send them on to the graduate student. Okay, if you have questions, raise your hand as we go, because now's the time to answer them. Here are the prerequisites. Everybody should have bio, the general biology, bio principles, biodiversity, um, and some general chemistry. Most of genetics today is all molecular, and so it's all chemically based. We're not going to get into any serious chemistry, but you should have some idea what a methyl group, what a phosphate group is. So when I'm talking about these chemical modifications, you're not thinking uh, methyl, that's CH, what, what? Have some familiarity. So if you don't have these prerequisites and you couldn't get into the course or whatever, just come talk to me. Everything you need is in the textbook. I think you'll be at a disadvantage, but we can talk about it. And if I think you have a pretty good chance of being successful in the course, then, you know, you can take the course. Organic chemistry and biochemistry would be helpful, um, but I know in most cases you haven't gotten to that point yet in the chemistry sequence. This is the textbook we're going to use. Uh, in my opinion, and also in the opinion of Dr. Hughes and Dr. Baldwin, who teach this same course down in Davie, this is one of the best introductory genetics textbooks available. You should find it interesting reading. He's a very good author. This is the fifth edition. It came out last year. Now, in the textbook, does anybody buy books from the textbook store anymore? I didn't think so. Okay. They are marketing it with an access code to something called Launchpad. So Launchpad is one of these interactive learning aids. We're not going to use it. It's not required. If you think it'll be helpful to you, then feel free to use it. Um, I think it's in the syllabus. I have a link that the publisher, prior to this edition, had a whole website with animations and videos and test questions and all sorts of study aids, which are freely accessible. You don't have to have an access code. It's, it's tied to, to the fourth edition, but 95% of it is still valid. Plus, there's study questions that are already up on Blackboard. Um, we'll talk about some of the other things. Plus, there's this thing called the Internet that this guy named Al Gore invented. You guys are too old. The only reason I say that his name is now resurfaced as a potential Democratic nominee for in the next presidential race. Although he looks a lot fatter than he did before. <laughs> and he did not invent the Internet. The important point is there is every topic that we're going to cover in this course is part of a genetics course in every university across the country. If you don't, if what I say doesn't make sense, if the book doesn't make sense, start Googling it. Somebody will have an animation, a video, a discussion, something that should say you finally get to the point where you go, yes, now I get it. The polymerase chain reaction I think is one of the best examples. One of our most important technologies now, and if you're interested in CSI, forensic science, all of that, and they do DNA analysis on a single drop of blood, you cannot do that without PCR. Okay. Well, I can walk you through three or four or five slides and show you how it works, but if you just see a video of it, then you can see. So you have all these resources. So personally, I don't think there's a need to be spending even more money and even more resources when all this information is out there at your fingertips. Make use of it. Okay. We're going to use Blackboard a lot to communicate. So this is where all of the information I'm going to give you will reside. So what's currently up there right now are the slides from all the lectures from last year. So this textbook, was this edition was used for the first time last year. I made all new slides. Things aren't going to change too much because it's still the same edition. So you can read these slides ahead of time before you come in. You have the textbook, you have the syllabus, and I've decided I'll just I'll make these video casts. I call them podcasts, now I'm being told they're video casts. They're really quick time movies that's a, a recording of what I'm saying, hopefully what you're saying, along with the slides. So it isn't going to be necessary to 
make your own recording or anything else. So if you miss class or just for reviewing, you're going to have all of that there. All right. Look at it before you come to class. I will say this several times. Each new slide that comes up should not be a surprise. Okay. What I don't do is I don't use the grade book. Here's the problem. Look around this room. There's a lot of you in here. Okay. If I put up your grade from the exam on grade book, you get the, the, core, the grade average, and you get your grade. And the grade average will be about a 78, I can tell you that now, after I adjust it a little bit. And you got a 72, and you can't figure out why you have a C-. minus. And that's because I'm a horrible instructor, and this material is incomprehensible. But the way I'm going to post these grades is I'm going to put... I'm going to assign a four-digit PIN number that will be in gradebook for you. I'm going to post the grades in rank order. And you're going to see that the reason that you got a 72 and a C- minus is because you had to go through six pages of grades and 180 students did better than you did. Okay? Based on past performance, and I, maybe you guys will be exceptional, I don't know. Last fall I had a class about the same size, about 10 students fewer, 10 students finished the course with over a 100 average. Okay. But the grades range from a high of about 107 at the end of the course to down in the area where a four-year-old would have scored by just randomly guessing and filling in circles on a Scantron. So there's a huge breadth in, in these grades. Okay. When you were four years old on a soccer team, fine, you are brilliant, you are gifted, you are special, and here's a blue ribbon for you. That's not how the world works, all right? Everybody sitting around here is your competition. And so you, I, need, I want you to see where you are in a rank order in the class and where you stand next to everybody else. So that's just the way I'm going to do this. So you will see your grades as we go. We'll talk a little bit more when we get to that slide. The key point here is don't look in the grade book for anything other than this PIN number, and I'll tell you a little bit later as we get a little closer to the exam how that's going to work. I'm just going to take two minutes to give you some professional advice. When you're sending an email to someone who can influence your professional career, write it as carefully as if you're writing a letter to the President of the United States, or a more importantly, a potential employer. Okay? There's this thing called grammar, that the pronoun I is always capitalized, that we work in things called sentences. So I've just picked out these two examples of a very, you know, not most well-written, but the first one is a very polite, and it, ad it addresses me, and it says thank you, and everything else. The second one, G afternoon, is the content section attached to this email. No, the content's in the blackboard. Read. Read. Okay? And I've had worse than this. I've had them starting out, hey, dude, all these things, okay? We're not drinking buddies, all right? Make a good impression and don't be sloppy in the emails. I would suggest write them in Word first. Spell check them. Read them for grammar. Because in many cases... Two years from now, you're going to come and ask me for a letter of recommendation, and I may just search through my emails to see whether you can even write, whether you can put two or three sentences together in some intelligible way. All right? Just a piece of advice. Okay. So here are the lecture notes. What I've provided for you on Blackboard, one of the reasons for giving you the slides ahead of time is I'm not training you to be court stenographers. And I know for myself, I'm not a very good note taker. Once I start to write, my brain disconnects. That's not good. There's a lot of science that says your memory's in your fingertips. Writing helps you remember. But you shouldn't be trying to write down everything I have up on the slides. So I've given them to you in a PDF format where there's three slides on the left-hand side of the page in space to fill in. So that you can make notes as I'm talking and pointing out things. We use figures a lot. I'll be saying, okay, draw your attention to right here. Right. Bring those notes. 
but you're not going to be having to write down everything that's up on the slide. Okay, in a week or so, I'm going to go give a talk to some freshmen on the Human Genome Project, and it always surprises me that they're just sitting there and they're writing as fast as they can to copy down. They're not listening to me. They're just writing down everything that's up on the slide. I can give you the slides. It's not my, you know, it's not my job to withhold information from you. So I'm trying to get this information out to you in as many different ways as I can since we all learn in different ways. All right. Um, there, I may make some changes to those lecture slides. You don't have to reprint them all. Any changes, they'll probably be fairly minor. They will be in the video cast then because that's what will be used. That will come straight from what was done in class. Any questions so far? 300 plus students, so there's got to be at least one question. No? Wow. Yes? Okay. Good question. I forgot to bring that up. The major difference between the fourth edition to the fifth edition is in the fourth edition, epigenetics is just kind of sprinkled throughout the chapters. The fifth edition has a whole chapter, and we're going to do a whole lecture on epigenetics. Otherwise, there's a little bit of restructuring. So overall, probably 90% of the fifth edition is the same as the fourth edition. If you got the fourth edition, or you got it cheap, or I'm not picking on you, but you're in here for the fourth time, so you've got the third edition and the fourth edition, and now you don't want to buy the fifth edition, um, you, sh you would be able to do it. The lectures are all key to it. The figures generally might have different numbers, but it's useful. But I think the major, uh, the epigenetics and the chapter on organeller genomes, genomes of mitochondria and chloroplasts, is slightly rearranged. So if you get that out of somebody else's fifth edition, you should be okay. Don't go back further than that. All right. Attendance. I know in the lower, in some of the freshman classes, they're almost manic about taking attendance and such, okay? I'm going to treat you like adults. One of the things I like about teaching at the university is when your parents call me, I can just tell them I can't talk to you, okay? Right. Are any of your parents going to call me? Please say no. Okay. So as such, if you want to come to class, that's fine. If you choose not to come to class, that's fine also. Okay. I think with the amount of material that I've put up on Blackboard, you could treat this as an online course, study yourself, and only show up for the exams. Now, the clickers we'll get to in a few minutes. While they are for extra credit, they're not going to be used for attendance, they do give me an indication of whether you're coming to class or not. In a class this size, there will be about three students who are going to stop coming to lecture based on stop that they won't be using the clicker after about the third lecture. And they will ace the course. And you, you three, raise your hands if you know who you are. <laughs> okay, You know who you are. But that's 1% of the class. The other is, and I'll show you some data in a few minutes, it is clearly to your benefit to come to class. All right? This is your career. This is your future. I'm on the downhill side, although I'm going to still be here for a while. I read these articles. Everybody's planning for retirement, then in parentheses, except university professors. Okay. So that's up to you. If you need to go to the restroom, right to the back. All right, just please leave quietly. Come back quietly without disturbing the class. So if you treat me as an adult and I can treat you as an adult, I think we can get around a lot of these issues. You don't, I've already had a couple of emails with some students who couldn't be here today and that you don't have, the only time you've got to deal with an attendance issue if it's going to affect you of uh, being here for an exam. I will tell you that once I get to know who the top students in the class are, interestingly, they rarely miss a lecture. Nancy sat right over there, and she's now probably finishing up at Baylor uh, Med School. Okay, one of our bets got like a 39 or 41 on her MCAT. 
something like that with a perfect 15 in biology. She could have aced this course without coming to class, but she came to every lecture. Okay. Whoops. Getting ahead of myself here. Uh, I think I missed... Um... Wow, that doesn't show up very well. I play around with these crazy colors because I'm colorblind, so I can get away with this stuff. But it doesn't always work. Okay, so here's the basic course requirements. There's going to be four multiple choice exams. Obviously, we're way too large to have written exams in here. Just because they're multiple choice doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I'm going to give you examples. In fact, I think by before the next class, I'm going to give you some sample questions on Blackboard the way I write the exams, and I'll even throw in some questions that are going to be verbatim from the exam but without the answers. Okay? It's going to be four multiple choice exams. Now, things have changed. There's two things that are important here. One is the universities, the way they set up this semester, the last actual lecture day is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. I didn't change, I didn't set that up, okay? We have to have the exam on that, on that day. So don't start coming to me with your buying plane tickets and everything else and need makeup exams and such. That Wednesday before we go to Thanksgiving break is a regular assigned lecture day. So exam four will be on that day. The exams are not cumulative, but the nature of the science is cumulative. So just because we cover Mendelian genetics on exam one doesn't mean that things like heterozygotes and F1 and F2 won't come up later on. So the nature of the, business, of the science is cumulative. The exams are not cumulative, and I will tell you, I've already told you on the syllabus exactly what chapters will be covered on each of those exams. Okay, there's an optional final exam that will be cumulative. You can use that exam to replace a missed exam, or it can replace your lowest regular exam grade. There'll be a significant number of students who will do poorly on the first exam because they didn't, they didn't prepare properly. But once they go through the first exam, they see how they have to change, how they prepare, and then they do much better on the second, third, and fourth exam take the cumulative exam and it completely replaces that horrible first exam grade. So in many cases, I, I've seen cases where grades have improved by an entire letter grade by being able to do that. There is no jeopardy involved in taking the final exam. If you take the final exam and it's the lowest of those five exams, it just gets discounted. So look, think of it this way. There's going to be five exams if you take the optional final. The highest four are the ones that count. You want to be in a position where you're happy with the grade when I post them after the fourth exam and you don't have to deal with it. Okay. Any questions on the course requirements? Yes. No. Okay, good point. The study, the questions at the end of the chapters are quite good. And that's why I suggested the solutions manual, because it's a way of learning how to think through these problems. The study questions that are on Blackboard now are in more depth, more detailed, and they're going to take you longer to, to answer than you could possibly have on the exam. So I think they're more challenging. But I feel like if you can understand, you don't have to, it doesn't mean work all those problems. Work enough of them until you feel like you understand the concept. Uh, basically, the multiple choice exams, I found about 45 questions works out well for the hour and a half that we have. Um, and so you really only have about two minutes on average per question. So the short answer is those study questions are more detailed, should be more challenging, should make your head hurt a little bit when you think through them. But I think once you see it, then you understand. Once you, once you understand the concept, then you can answer. There's only so many ways I can ask the question. Does that answer your question? Or did I kind of dodge it too much? Okay. Um, 
Makeup exams only under truly exceptional circumstances. That's the other reason for that optional final exam. It's your responsibility to be here. You know, I don't want to know that I-95, yes, I know that I-95 has traffic backups all the time. Make sure you're here. Make sure you're on time. Um, for truly exceptional circumstances, you, know, you can show me that you were in you know, the ER while we're taking the exam, then I might think about it. Okay. Nope. So I just kind of straight. Okay. All right. So on the exam day, here's a couple of things. And here, here was the challenge. I can't allow you to use calculators now because you got calculators, Google Glasses, iPhones, iPad. Everything looks the same. So no electronic devices. I've written the problems in a way that I think if you understand the concepts, the math is very straightforward. You should be able to work it out very easily. Okay. So no electronic devices. All you need are the blue Scantron form. Everybody you should be familiar with those. Two sharpened pencils. Sharpen them ahead of time. Looks like maybe it's been, re may or may not still be on the wall or maybe they took it down. Don't come in here. You know, come down and ask me if I have pen. I've had students come in and ask me for pencils and a Scantron. All right. If you don't have a Scantron, I will have them for sale for $20 a piece <laughs> down here. Okay. I've got to pay the mortgage somehow. All right. And also bring a photo ID and you'll have to show that photo ID. We're going to have several grad students down here proctoring and collecting exams to so bring the photo ID. Cell phones, everything else, just put it away. All right. Yes? Well, my first graduate advisor, I could give you his advice, was know everything. All right. But no, you brought up a good point. So let me tell you this. Even though this is an introductory textbook, there's going to be, there is material in there we're not going to cover. So you've actually made, up a, good, made a good point. If it's not in the notes, and if I didn't talk about it in class, it won't be on the exam. Okay? For instance, there are sections in this textbook when we get to transposable elements, it goes into incredible detail. And I could, I'd have to build an entire lecture, even two lectures, around the detail of those transposable elements. So I'm going to cut out from that what I think is the most important information. So I didn't mean to be facetious. That's just what I was told. <laughs> yeah, just know everything kind of thing. But, yes, yeah, so what I would do is use the, the slides as a guide through the chapter. The lectures are very closely tied to the textbook. All right? Dr. Pierce has done an excellent job of putting this book together. There's no reason for me to try to reinvent that wheel. We use the same figures, except I have a few figures in a couple of places that I'll give you that I think are better than the ones that are in the textbook. But if we don't cover it in class and it's not in the notes, it won't be on the exam. Okay, also, you're going to get stuck in traffic, or your dog's going to get sick, or your kid's going to get sick, and you... Or you can't find a parking place because we're getting to be like a real university now and parking <laughs> is, is difficult. So I'll have these video casts, unless I have some technical problem, but the old ones from last year are up there now. For a couple of things. If you miss class, you can you'll know you can listen to what and see what we talked about. And the other is to fill in those little gaps because I went too quickly on something and you didn't quite hear what I said. Something like that. So that information is out there. You'll be able to get it. Uh, they're rather large files. Uh, they, some of them, they, most of them are anywhere from about 600 megabytes to about a gigabyte or a little bit larger. Um, but assuming everybody has access to, you know, don't try downloading it from a dial-up modem. You guys don't even know what that is, so don't worry about it. Okay. okay. All right. So we're going to use the eye clickers in class. If, if you've taken this class before or you know other students, I was doing both online quizzes and eye clickers. I'm going to get rid of the online quizzes. I, I don't think they were really that useful. 
but I'm going to increase the extra credit value. So here's a couple of important points. All right. The only extra credit that isn't linked to the exams, I can always can't resist putting one or two extra credit questions on the exam, is the eye clicker. But I'm going to make it worth a maximum of 10 points. I'm going to make it worth your while to be here. If you're math challenged, that's a full letter grade potential. But here's what I'm going to do. You're going to get points for participation. It's a learning tool. It's not a test. It's a learning tool. And so the idea is that you are here and you're participating. And so at the beginning of each lecture, assuming I get this software issue figured out by next, by Wednesday, um, participation will be 20 points. So for each, for each lecture, you get 20 points automatically for participation. But you must answer every single question in that lecture. If you come in late and you leave early, you're not going to get the points. All right. So that's going to make up about 40% of that 10%. So if you came to every class and answered every question wrong, you'd still get about four points extra credit. Now, all of our grades are based on percentages and everything, you know, you got a 92 or whatever, but I still, at the end, have to give grades based on letter grades, which is what they did when my grandfather was in a one-room schoolhouse more than 100 years ago. But that's what I have to do. So you're at that 90, let's say you're at that 88. So you just got a B plus. But if you can get up to 93, you get five points extra credit, the B plus now becomes an A. It's significant. Now, a couple of years ago, I had a student called me up and was complaining he wanted to rate, he had an 89.4, which was a B plus. Well, he didn't have a single clicker point. Fine, that's optional. But we were doing online quizzes at the time. He didn't take a single online quiz. So fine, it stays as a B plus. So this helps me justify whether you get that higher grade based on participation. So you're going to get 20 points for participation. Then what I'm trying, and this is what my grad student Diane is working with me, we're going to start the lecture with two questions. One's going to be based on the information from the previous lecture. The second will be on the material we're going to be covering that day. Each of those will each be worth 10 points. So that's 40 points. Then sprinkled throughout the lecture, three, four, five, more questions, six, whatever is appropriate, those will each be worth two points. So it'll be approximately 50 points per lecture, with almost 40% going to participation. All right. So making it a little more, should be a little more enticing to actually come to class. All right. I know it's at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you guys are starting to zone out, and I'm twice as old as everyone in this room, probably, and you can't keep up with me, because I've been drinking coffee since 5.30 this morning, okay? <laughs> My dog's been waking me up at 5.30 every morning for 10 years now, okay? So I've been on the caffeine express. If I, I just found out, crystal light. You can get crystal light with caffeine in it now, okay? <laughs> so I'm trying that. When I was in grad school, I had a friend of mine. Uh, I don't know if they still make the equivalent. They call them no-dos, but they're really caffeine tablets. You can say, yeah. Tony used to dissolve them in his coffee. Okay. So, all right. So try to stay with me. So, why should yes? Here's what's happening. I'm going to the iClicker too because it gives me more options in terms of text and such. I think. The, uh, the original eye clicker will work, but you won't be able to answer those questions that aren't in a multiple choice format, which means you won't get the participation points. See how it works? Well, what is, you know, the eye clicker costs what? Less than a tank of gas. You know, it's your career. All right, you know, your future. Yes? Yeah. Um, you get feedback from the eye clicker. Yeah, and let me qualify it. I don't 
The eye clicker is supposed to integrate with the Blackboard and the gradebook. It's supposed to upload those. Blackboard is an imperfect system. And I got hundreds of possible grades coming up here. And, and it's not that big a percentage at the end. If I'm convinced that it works efficiently, I'll do it. But otherwise, you get feedback from the eye clicker that, and the hardware is quite good. So you get feedback that your response was received to. If you have questions whether your eye clicker is working or not, fine. Come to my office during my office hours. We can test it out and make sure it works. Otherwise, it just gets into hundreds and hundreds of grades that only are still making up a very small fraction of your total grades. There's a question over here, yeah. Yeah, could you give us an example of what other questions would you ask besides a multiple choice question? Because you can put in, for instance, a numeric answer. Okay. Instead of you giving you the answer, you can just tell me. So you want to answer that right. Right. Yeah, okay. Or you can put in short text, that sort of thing. Okay, so I've, I know it's been out for a while, so we just, since we're rewriting the questions and everything else, you know, it's time to move on. Okay. Yes, I know many of you are running Windows XP, and it's fine, and it worked 15 years ago. And you'll quickly learn that I'm an Apple bigot, and I don't do Windows. If you have a Windows question, don't come to me. Okay. Because I don't know what the hell is going on. All right. Any other questions? Yes? I'm going to double check on that. I'm, I'm pretty sure the way it has to work now is you've got to register through Blackboard, or there's a fee. And last year, and again, I'm trying to get this, there's a software glitch, actually a problem in updating the firmware on the clicker base. That worked extremely well last year. And so the registration is not a problem. Here, and let, let me explain to you how the clickers work. All registration does is links your name to the serial number being transmitted from the clicker. So as long as I get your name registered before the end of the course, you're okay. So even if you're not registered, if I get all this problem worked out by Wednesday and we're good to go, even if you're not registered, the data is being collected. And as soon as you get registered, it links them up. Okay. So let me hold off and, and make sure I get this firmware problem fixed on, my, on the base. Okay. So I'm giving you now. Yes. They have to be number two, they have to be read by the scanner. Okay, but as long as the scanner reads it, okay. Okay. So, okay, so while you're mentioning that, write this down if you have to. The scanners are stupid machines, but they're extremely accurate. And I have students that come to me and they look on, and what I will have is all the exams will be numbered and I will keep those. And I won't be able to answer questions during the exam because you're just too, mega, too many students and I'm just too damn big to try to get into the middle of that group in there to answer somebody's question. So you can write notes on your exam. When you come to review it with me in my office, I can pull that exam out and we can look at it. And the students will swear that they put down A and it's marked wrong. And we pull out the Scantron and they mark down B. You guys have been filling these things out since kindergarten and you still surprised how among good students they bubble in the wrong answer. So be very careful with that. It still happens. It should almost be second nature to you by now, but it does happen. Okay, so I've made a compelling case for why you shouldn't come to class. All right, it's all on the line. Why bother to come to class and such? So let's uh, try and confuse the issue by looking at some actual data. So I asked the question and said, does it really matter whether students come to class or not? So this was from about a year ago, maybe two years ago. I just simply looked at what percentage of students who got an A in the course had less than 20% of the eye clicker points. At that time, you would have gotten more than 20% if you came to every class and answered every question wrong. So if you had at least 20%, that meant you were coming to class. Well, you get exactly the obvious answer. Students who got A's, nearly all were coming to class. The students at D and F, almost 60% weren't even didn't have the eye clicker points. 
So to me, it makes the argument come to class. But make your own decision. You're the adults. You're the one paying for this. All right. The best way for me to guarantee having horrible student evaluations is if I actually gave you your money's worth. So I'll try not to give you your money's worth completely. But you should know, for instance, we're going to find out, well, I can't do the survey questions until the next time. Probably about 80% of you are pre-meds, pre-health or whatever. The MCAT has a lot of genetics on it. It's one of the major areas. So the material you're going to learn in here is going to be a major factor in how you do on that exam and how you do on that exam is a major factor in whether or not you get admitted to med school. Okay. So anybody who can't read the graph? Anybody going to admit they can't read the graph? Okay. So this is the part. I had several questions, but we're gonna, I'm just going to go through these because um, I'll do these. On, I'll try to do these on Wednesday because they're useful for me. And I use this information with the chairman as we're planning things. Uh, yeah, how about that? You'll even have the answers. Okay. So how do you how do you succeed in this class? Okay. Um, first of all, there's going to be some students in here who are just going to study less and do and do very well. That's just the nature of it. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had two students taking the class. They were housemates. Um, Jennifer worked really hard, came to my office all the time, asked lots of questions. I know she was working hard. She got a C in the course. Her housemate, Lynn, she said, came to every class, sat next to her, never took notes, um, barely studied, and she had the top grade in the class. It's just some people will get it. All right. But how do, you, how do you get to be successful? you got to move away from simply trying to memorize PowerPoint slides the night before to thinking about concepts. So here's a uh, couple of quotes I took directly from Rate My Professor, the you know, fail-proof way of picking classes. Uh, I think the last time I looked, I have about six comments up there over five years, so six out of about 1,500 students. Yeah, that's good statistics. All right. If you attend lecture and work hard, you can definitely get an A. Okay. Attend lecture. Read the book. Do well on the test. The tests are somewhat hard, but it gives you some extra credit. All right. But this one, genetics. Very hard material, and his exams are insane. You have to understand and be able to apply concepts to get any questions correct, but not just memorization. Well, this is, was definitely written in a negative context, but this student got it right. You have to be able to start working with information. That's what scientists do. We, if, the, if this whole profession was about memorizing facts, nobody would go into this business. We got facts at our fingertips. It's what can you do with that information, okay? And the other thing I find very disappointing about Rate My Professor is at least the last time I looked, I have zero chili peppers. <laughs> All right. So this is a concept-driven course. And for many students, microbiology and genetics are sort of the portal to these upper division courses, where your professors are going to start to expect you to think critically, to be able to interpret data and such. The way I try to structure the exams, if you memorize the definitions and you memorize what's on the slides, you'll probably get about 60% of the questions right. You'll probably get a C, maybe. Okay. To do better than that, you have to begin to work with that information and be able to do something with it, and at the highest level is to take new information, take and apply what you already know, and apply it to that new situation. Okay. So I don't have the clicker with me, but let's just do a couple of questions because what I want to show you is kind of my idea of, okay, here's a basic memorization question. Here's a little more challenging question and a question I think would be more at the top. Okay, basic memorization question. The meiotic phase during which chromosomes align along the imaginary line through the middle of the cells is called what? You can just shout it out. Metaphase. metaphase, you know that. Fine. What does that mean? I don't know what happens at metaphase. What's going on in the cell? We're going to talk about that in more detail. 
But you can answer that question without having a clue what, what's really happening in the cell. You just memorize the picture, the chromosomes were in the middle, and it was called metaphase. So this is just a basic memorization question. Okay. Getting a little more difficult. You should be able to answer this one. But now you've got to start putting a couple of different concepts from Mendelian genetics together. So you're going to start with a monohybrid cross between two, breeding, two true breeding parents. You have to know what that means. i even tell you what it is. What proportion of the F2 generation will be heterozygotes? Can you answer it? How many with A, since I don't have clickers? B, they're all looking at each other. Wait. C, D, good, okay. But you had to know some terminology, you had to extend it beyond just simply to the F1 generation and be able to work with it. So it's getting a little more difficult. I'll call that moderate difficulty. Okay, uh, let's see. Another one, you make a monohybrid cross of one parent with the wild type phenotype, the other parent has the recessive phenotype. What proportion of the F2 generation will be heterozygotes? What's the answer? E? E, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. I did get it. Okay. Yes. To be in a situation also to recognize that you don't have enough information. What's missing here? Exactly. Because of the recessive nature. We'll get into that again. You don't really know whether those parents are homozygous dominant or heterozygous. So you don't have enough information to work with it. All right. This is one, at least, I think, puts it in, a little, in more of the, in sort of the top level of the challenging, and that is coming up with new information. So it's related to color blindness. So you, you have a new form of red-green color blindness that's caused by a dominant X mutation. Is color blindness a dominant mutation? No, it's recessive. So could you have a dominant mutation that causes color blindness? No. There's no possible way that that gene could be mutated so it acts as a... Is there only one possible allele of that gene? Okay, we could change... If we Technically, if we change any nucleotide in that gene, we've made a new allele of it. So here you're being told that there's a new allele that's now acting as a dominant mutation. Now you're going to have to know what a dominant mutation is. You're going to have to know what sex-linked inheritance is. It says it's estimated that fewer in, than one in a million people have this new allele. So what does that tell you? All right. So Jill has red-green color blindness, and DNA tests confirm that she has this new dominant allele. So is she homozygous dominant or a heterozygote? Why? Well, assuming Jill is not another Bruce Jenner case, <laughs> let's assume she has two X chromosomes. It's a dominant allele. So she's going to be colorblind whether she's a heterozygous, whether she's heterozygous or a homozygous dominant. But what is she probably? What information up there tells you probably what, which one of those two is correct? It says that there's only one in a million people have that allele. To be homozygous dominant, both of her parents would have to have that allele, right? And assuming your parents didn't meet at a family reunion, you have to have, you would multiply those two probabilities. So the chance that two unrelated people have this allele is 1 million 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 6. That's 1 in 10 to the 12. That's about 10,000 fold more than the population of the Earth. So it's extremely unlikely, not impossible, 
but it's most likely she's a heterozygote. All right? But you're extending from the information that you're given there. All right, so her partner Bill has normal color vision, so he just has the normal allele. What proportion of her children would now be colorblind? Would all the daughters be colorblind? No, only half, in principle. Uh, could any of the sons be colorblind? Sure, the same half. 50%. Uh, so it looks to me like D. 50% of the sons and 50% of the daughters. Because basically they're both going to have a 50-50. Both sexes have a 50-50 chance of inheriting that allele from the mother. Okay? But it's taking what you already know about sex-linked inheritance, but putting a whole new level, a whole different set of data on it. But now apply the same concepts and principles. See? Nothing to it, right? Okay. Okay. Now, since I'll have a little extra time, I can spend on this. The next couple things here, I don't intend to be mean, but I think some students need a reality check about their future. Okay. So we're going to get into that in a few minutes. But I'm also, as I go through this, I'm going to talk about some programs that we have, graduate programs, undergrad programs, why I think they're good. And one of the things I would suggest is the CMBB Research Seminar. It's on Wednesday afternoon, right after class. So I'll leave here, and we'll walk over to the new engineering building in room 106, and it's being video conferenced up to Jupiter. Now, in the past, the speakers have all been here in Boca, and it's been video conferenced to Jupiter and Davy. Now that we have this large contingent of scientists at Mox, Planck, and Scripps, does everybody in here realize that FAU is associated with two of the biggest biomedical research institutions in the world? Okay. Mox, Planck is bigger than the National Institutes of Health, considerably. Okay. So you have some amazing opportunities up there, especially in the areas of neurobiology. I'll tell you a little bit about those programs. What we're going to be doing now is some of the seminar speakers will be up in Jupiter and they're going to video conference down here and some are going to be here and they're going to video conference up there. I encourage these research seminars are a basic part of all graduate student research scientist training and what they are is somebody is inviting a colleague from another institution to come in and talk science, to talk about what they do in the lab. I encourage undergraduates to go to these public seminars to see a very important way in which science, professional scientists interact with each other. All right. Now, you may get lost technically in the talk. It's, they're usually targeted for graduate students and higher levels of training, although because we have so many undergraduates, we make it a point for every speaker. We say, you know, give it a little broader introduction. We're going to have a lot of undergrads in there. What's more important for you is if you're sitting in that audience, can you imagine yourself being that invited speaker? If so, then you're going to need a PhD, and you're going to be the one who's going to be responsible for writing the grants and, and writing the papers and getting the money and running the show, but you'll also be the one who's invited to do that. If, on the other hand, you like science, you like being part of this, you'd like to work as part of a research team, but you don't want those responsibilities, then a master's degree will make you quite competitive. And I can tell you a little bit about that more later on. Um, you know, most of my master's students have jobs. They got jobs right away. You're going to find out that having just a bachelor's degree makes it very tough to break into the system. So uh, there's about 30 open seats still in the course. Um, the only requirement is to show up. It's a pass-fail. It counts as a DIS credit. So you can use three DIS credits toward your undergrad degree. All you got to do is I just take attendance. My whole motivation is because many students don't know what they don't know. And 
For some students, it will make a big difference in their career plans. Now, even if you don't want to enroll in the course, on Wednesday, Dr. Fairbanks, and some of you may know him, he teaches at PBSC and such. He's going to give a talk about a whole range of jobs, primarily probably in the pharmaceutical industry that he's most familiar with, that aren't research-based jobs. But they pay very well, and they're just lots of different options. So it's there to give you different career options, different ways about thinking, and that there's more out there than just medical school. All right. So that'll be on Wednesday. Again, they're public seminars. You can enroll if you want, not enroll, uh, but you're, you're free to attend them. Okay, so you want to be a doctor. I didn't get to do it this time because of the eye clicker problem, but in the past about 50% of the students in this class will tell me they are on a path to be MDs. About 80% will say they're interested in some aspect of healthcare. MD, DOs, vet schools, PharmD, PA programs. How many people going after the PA? Okay, that's getting to be bigger and bigger now. Okay. So that's around 70 to 80% of the students. By my very rough estimates, uh, look around you. All right, there's a lot of you in here. This is probably about 40% of the students who are going to take genetics this year. All right. So assuming you're kind of randomly distributed, and how many of you have been up to student services, you've been up to the advisors, and they have the wall of fame up there, and they have the pictures of the students who got into med school and such, okay? Well, if you actually count those, it's about 70. About 70 or 80 a year, optimistically. So that, to me, tells me that about 30 students, about 10% of that, this class is going to be there. Pretty much this group right here. All right, you have to be in this group, or you got to have something else going for you. So if you're just going to come to class and get your degree, you will graduate. The bar is not that high; it really isn't. Okay. And if you haven't been to a commencement, Andy Warhol was wrong. You don't have 15 minutes of fame; you have 15 seconds. You step up on the stage, they mispronounce your name, you come up, you shake hands with the dean, you shake hands with the president, you go down, you get your picture taken, and you turn around and there's hundreds coming behind you, and they all want your position, okay? But the problem is that it's so competitive to get into these programs, some good students aren't going to get into these programs. What I'm trying to do now is just give you some other options, and the main thing is, the biology degree by itself is not particularly valuable. It's a starting point to higher level training. If you want to be a true professional, you're going to need graduate training, professional training, and such. And I want to just tell you a little bit about the programs that are here. You may or may not even know about them. Um, and some of the advantages and disadvantages. Okay. Dr. Frazier, I know many of you know her. You probably had her in the general biology. She runs the undergraduate honors program. I've been working with, I've usually had one or two of these students in my lab for about the last four years. It's a lot of fun. They're really good students to work with. Nicole is a PhD student in neurobiology at the University of Miami. Daniela is in med school at Miami. James is a PhD student at Princeton with a Nobel laureate. Jessica just started med school at UCF. These students are successful. The advantage is, and I really push upon you, get involved with the DIS, get involved in the lab, because you're going to need letters of recommendation. Many of you are going to come to me a year or two years from now, and you're going to want a letter of recommendation. And quite honestly, I probably won't remember. Okay, It'll be fun to talk to you and such, but it'll be hundreds of students from now. And I can look up your grades and see that you did very well in the course and such. But I can tell that just by looking at a transcript. All right. You get into this honors program, you're getting real research experience. You got some professors who are getting to know you and can talk about those traits that are important in success in graduate programs and professional schools that aren't on a transcript. If you get A's in both sections of the honors, 
you get this noted on your transcript. So at least now you've got something that's beginning to distinguish you from the rest of the herd. So the way this works is she does intro to honors in fall. I mean, sorry, in spring. This is where you get introduced to the faculty. I'll go in and talk for about 30 minutes about what I do in my lab. Other professors come in, and that's when the students start pairing up at that point. Then you work in their lab through the summer. You do a thesis proposal in fall, and then a thesis defense in spring. Is it a lot of work? Yes. Okay, is it challenging? But it's going to work on your writing skills and really give you a feel for what, if you're looking at a graduate program, what you can really expect from it. So I think it's an excellent program, although the number of students that can get into it is very limited. Recommendations. I wanted to show you this because this is a typical, yes. No, she's on the Boca campus. Yeah. Her office is, uh, I'm in room 210. Her office is two offices down from mine, so probably at 212. She's on the second floor of the biology building. Okay, it also, so if you're interested in DIS, go to the faculty list on our biology website. There's close to 100 faculty and affiliate faculty on there. There's two emeritus professors at the bottom. Uh, don't try to contact them because they both passed away recently. Emeritus means they're not really working here anyway. But there's nearly 100 professors on there who are approved to do DIS with biology students. So you have lots of opportunity. Some are in Davie, some here in Boca, some up in Jupiter, some at Harbor Branch. Okay. Recommend? Yes? Okay. DIS stands for Directed Independent Study. This is really the way in which you get a chance to get into a laboratory, get some research experience, get to know the professors, and see if you like this. Um, when I was, I was going part-time to the university. I was in Tampa, so I just went to USF. It was there. And I went part-time because I was out of high school, and I was just so glad because I was bored out of my mind. And I had skills in construction and such that I could make enough money to support myself. I was just having a good time. But I did probably more to make sure my mother wasn't too disappointed. I was taking a couple of classes in the evening. Okay. In fact, this is my closest part to celebrity. Everybody, you know that Gerber baby that's on the little baby food jars? That was my high school English teacher. <laughs> and she scared the hell out of me about freshman English. So I just, that's all I took. But after about four or five years, I realized, you know, working sucks. This is, to do this every day and get dirty and sweaty and to see men on a, a construction site that are my age now, it's like, I can't do this. So I started thinking about grad school. I didn't know anything about grad. Did I even like research? So I got into somebody's lab as an undergraduate to see if I even liked it. Well, as a lab rat, I loved it. Um, so that's what it's really about. It's, it, it's just a freedom to you and a professor makes some agreement. And you can use three of these credits. They're ungraded. They're not graded. They won't affect your GPA. It's just a pass-fail, satisfactory, unsatisfactory. And it just gives you a chance to kind of test the waters before you try to move on. Yes? Dr. Frazier's? I would be doing DIS before I even got there. My suggestion is... Get into somebody's lab. You're going to be, technically, you would be doing hers. Three, if you're going to graduate in the spring, you start in the spring of the following year. Best case scenario, you should have been in somebody's lab for a year at that point. Um, so, yeah, you can start any time. It's just an agreement between you and a, and a professor. And as long as they agree to it, they sign you up for it. Yes? It, if I'm following the question, it depends on you and the professor. For instance, I've had students come into my lab before they take genetics. I don't think they get as much from it because they're kind of lost in the jargon and such. But it doesn't mean they can't have a good experience at it. So it's really very personalized. It's just between you and the professor, and it can be 
almost anything. Right? But it's linking you up to somebody. And the value is, for you, is when it comes time to write these letters of recommendation. This is a typical form that I get now. Most of them are all online. And this is one I actually submitted. Intellectual ability, yeah, I can evaluate that. Written communication, oral skills, emotional maturity, adaptability, team skills, dependability, conflict resolution, interpersonal skills, awareness of limitations. You guys don't have any limitations, I like that. Reaction to criticism, patient interaction, overall evaluation. All but two of those I had to write not observe. Because I just was a student who took this class from me two years ago. Now, if you're a DIS student or an honors student, I fill that out in a very different way. So I just want you to see, this is what the professors are being asked to put into these recommendations. Give them some information they can work with. Uh, the other is graduate training. As you're going to find out, or you've already found out, biology is a popular degree, but it's a starting point in most cases. Some students will get lucky. They'll get a break, get into a company, get somewhere, and then they can move on from there. At this point, I think the master's degree makes you the most marketable. And among my thesis students and the students in the professional science master's program I'll tell you about, virtually every one of them got jobs before they finished writing their thesis or immediately afterwards. Okay. Because it gives you experience. Right? When they say they want a bachelor's degree and some experience, they want internships, they want DIS, they want something besides the fact you just came to class. Okay. The master's program, we have a long-standing program in the thesis. Uh, you can also, one of the advantages of the sciences over other areas is you can get paid to go to graduate school. As I was told, you don't pay for graduate school, you let someone else pay for it. So those teaching assistants who are in your labs, teaching your labs for micro and the general biology, the biodiversity and such, they're getting an 80% reduction of their graduate tuition, plus they're getting paid a stipend on top of that. Okay, We have the PhD in integrated biology, and that's now been expanded out to being a PhD in integrated biology and neuroscience. This is in collaboration with Max Planck. Max Planck has at least one and possibly two Nobel laureates that are on their staff working up in Jupiter. So technically, an FAU student could work for a Nobel laureate. Now, your degree will be from FAU, but the next step in your career is, oh, you work with Burke Sackman? Yeah, we we're at the Max Planck Institute. Now it raises things to a whole other level. Now, if you're more interested in the Scripps scientists, you can apply to the PhD program at Scripps. That is, they are fully accredited through California, through the Kellogg College. So there, your PhD would be from the Scripps Institute. So you have an opportunity to work with some real... And besides that, you got some, you got some really good faculty in the biology department. How many are interested in neurobiology? Okay, big area. Thing is, it's all on Jupiter. It's all up there as part of the Life Science Initiative. Um, I have this professional science master's program. It's a fairly new category of master's degrees, but the idea is rather than being a stepping stone to the PhD, it's a terminal degree that's supposed to get the student into the job market. What it really is, um, is a non-thesis degree that has a significant amount of business courses. We set this up as business biotechnology. So the idea is, this is a student who's really interested in science but doesn't see themselves standing at the bench with a micropipetter every day. But they're interested in the business side of the company. These businesses have to raise venture capital. They have to deal with intellectual properties. They have to generate a profit at some point. And so the courses are about half science, half business, and then it ends with an internship. The rationale for internships is it gives you real experience and hopefully a job offer. All right. My daughter is in a completely different area, but she did an internship with a 
Fortune 500 company that just got bought for $9 billion. Well, six months later, they turned it into a real job and she has better benefits than I do. Okay, That's how these things can come about. The internships are an inexpensive, non-committal way for that employer to evaluate you and for you to evaluate them. So uh, to my knowledge, all of our graduates of this program, all the ones I know about, have all had either had job offers, one turned a job down because he went into the PhD program, or they were working within just a matter of a month or so after they graduated. So our success rate, it's, it's a small program, it surprised me, I only have about 10 students in it. Um, it, is a, it is the same full Masters of Science, not a certificate, it is the full academic diploma. Any of these I'll be free to ask about those. Uh, and this is Dr. Fairbanks. Uh, again, On this will be at 4 o'clock. All right. So that's a little bit of discussion about your future. All right. Don't get antsy. Hang on. Okay. Um, I can probably do this by a show of hands because I always know how this goes. I know, it's, I know this is long. It's two hours. Okay, it's the middle of the afternoon. Raise your hand if you'd rather not take a break and finish 10 minutes early, and we'll, break, we'll get out of here at very punctually at 20 minutes to 4, as opposed to a 10-minute break. And that's always what I get, overwhelming. Okay, so you have to stay with me. Okay. So we've covered the background, so any questions on what's required for the course? All right. Try to give you some ideas about what you can do in terms of thinking and planning. And at your, you are at a critical junction right here. You're, most of you are probably sophomore, junior, and you've got to start shaping your future at this point. And I'm trying to show you some of the options that you have here. What I want to do in this last part is we're going to go through just chapter one very quickly. Chapter one is really just kind of a historical overview of genetics and just kind of give us a broad brush painting of where we're going with this. On Tuesday, we're going to cover meiosis and mitosis. And I think I'm going to give you some detail that you maybe haven't seen before. The rationale being, as I said before, if you understand chromosome behavior during meiosis, then all of the observations that Mendel made make perfect sense. You don't have to think about it in terms of probability. So we'll have that chapter two on Wednesday. So while this will be on, while chapter one will be on the exam, it'll, it'll be pretty minor. Okay. A few years ago, five, six years ago, I thought maybe the importance of genetics was going to start to diminish with all the new areas in immunology and such. But now with the fact that the human, that you can sequence a human genome for less than a thousand dollars in a couple of days and all sorts of areas and some things about junk DNA that are no longer true, and I think the emergence of personalized medicine and epigenetics. Genetics is going to be one of the most important areas of biology. Right? Now, I was a chemistry major. I love biochemistry. I trying to figure out my career, decide, well, maybe I'll be a biology chemistry dual major. And there wasn't really anything in biology I found interesting until I got to genetics. And then Professor King, Dr. King, not the Dr. King, but Dr. King pointed out that he fell in love with genetics when he realized that no matter what the topic, it always involves sex. And I said, okay, I can, get around, I can wrap my head around this. It's changed dramatically, and what we're going to do is really start kind of with Mendel. Like I said, we're just going to do one lecture on Mendelian genetics. And Mendel did his work about 150 years ago. But the next, to me, major revolution came in the 1970s when it became possible to do molecular cloning. Up until that point, eukaryotic genomes were just too complex. And that is why the majority of the work up to that point was done with bacteria, specifically E. coli, and viruses because mammalian genomes were just intractable. So what we'll see so much in genetics is scientists asking questions waiting for tools to be available to address that question. All right. But now genomics and bioinformatics 
that's really the newest revolution. Um, so this is really just to say at, at the heart of it, we're going to do a lot of comparing and contrasting between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. But there are some fundamental principles in there that you just see through evolution that have carried through from the most primitive organisms all the way up to humans. Um, one of the most interesting things is all cells as we know them have double-stranded DNA as their genetic material. Now viruses, are viruses living organisms? No, they're basically a piece of nucleic acid wrapped up in protein. With viruses, there's all sorts, almost any configuration of nucleic acid you can think of, there are viruses. DNA viruses, RNA viruses, single-stranded RNA viruses, single-stranded DNA viruses, circular double-stranded DNA viruses, circular single-stranded DNA viruses. However, no one has found a virus that has both DNA and RNA. So there's a fundamental difference there. We'll talk about all I'm, I'm just going through this stuff very quickly to kind of give you a big overview. All right. Other couple of universal things. The genetic code is universal. They taught you that, right? Well, it's nearly universal. There's a few exceptions. But the same genetic code is used throughout. There's a central dogma of biology that Francis Crick, Crick, Francis Crick laid out. And that is that genetic information flows unidirectionally from DNA to RNA to protein. And that held up until the discovery of the retroviruses like HIV, where you have a situation where the genetic material is RNA and then it becomes DNA. So what we see is exceptions keep coming out of all of this. The other important thing, and at least the kind of research I like to do, is to work with model organisms. So to work with organisms where you have good tools, good genetics, and you take advantage of the fact that evolution there's a conservation of structure and function through evolution. So we can study problems in Drosophila that actually have relevance, for instance, in humans. But we can do experiments in those flies that we cannot do in humans. All right? if, you, if you're in a lab and you work with vertebrates of any type, mice, sea turtles, or whatever, your, your advisor, the head of the lab, has to write out these very detailed protocols of how those animals are going to be handled and it has to be reviewed by a university committee, and it is very technical and very tedious and very formal, and you have to go through this process. Drosophila, I can do anything I want. Okay? There is no Drosophila liberation front breaking into the lab and freeing <laughs> thousands of flies in the middle of the night. Okay? So if you're going to do genetics, here's just a couple of things you're looking for. You want short generation times, you need lots of progeny so you can do some good statistics. They adapt well to a laboratory environment, fairly easy to take care of, and their genomes are fully sequenced. So just to give you an example of a few of these, these are the most important ones and ones we'll talk about. Our old friend Escherichia coli, which at one point was the most studied organism on the planet prior to really molecular cloning work and such. Um, why do you think E. coli became the model organism for bacteria. Is it a good representative of bacteria in general? No, not really if you talk to the hardcore microbiologist. Okay. What it turns out was actually there was a physicist named Max Delbruck right around the 1940s, about the time the atom was being split and the atomic bomb was being built, who decided that all the big questions in physics that had been answered, he was wrong on that point, he wanted something really complicated to study, so he thought he'd go after genetics. And he also organized other investigators and said, let's all work with the same organism so we can compare notes. So it was really from that that E. coli became sort of the, the prototypical single-cell bacterial eukaryotic or prokaryotic model. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or yeast, is really, it's the most simplest eukaryotic model. So it has many of the growth characteristics of E. coli and such, but it is a true eukaryotic cell. I did some really important, probably some of my best science was done in grad school with Saccharomyces because I used to make my own beer. That's why I took all those courses in biochemistry. C. elegans, this little nematode, 
really important model in development. Dr. Gia works with it for something called autophagy. Again, its whole genome has been sequenced, but the big thing was these organisms, the whole fate map, in other words, the fate of every single cell in these organisms, that map was all worked out. They knew which cell gave rise to which cell. It's something like 1,100 cells or something like that in the organism. So it was a really early important model for developmental biology. Here's our friend Drosophila. Uh, we got over 100 years of genetics. So Thomas Hunt started using Drosophila in the early 1900s. So we're just, just a little over 100 years of genetics with it now. Many human genes that are involved in disease processes, cancers and such, those genes were first identified in Drosophila. Some of them still carry that, that same name, like for instance, one was called Sonic Hedgehog, and it still uses that same name for the human counterpart. Um, for the plant molecular biologists, uh, probably not so much anymore, but this little weed, Arabidopsis, was really kind of became the model organism for the plant molecular biologist. Anybody interested here in botany? Uh, we always have a lot of them. Anyway, so you're taking uh, Dr. Zhang's plant biotech course? You should. He's got a DNA gun in there. You can go shoot the plants, make your own transgenic plants. Plus, if you like small classes, I think he's only got six or eight students in the whole class. But he's got something called the DNA gun, where you literally, it's small little, probably titanium or platinum pellets coated with DNA, and you fire it at the cells. And as they go through the cells, the DNA gets stripped off, and that's how you get the DNA into the cells. And I figure it was probably invented by, this is the way it could happen. You've got two grad students sitting in a bar. So I sound like a joke, doesn't it? Two grad students sitting in a bar. No, a lot of science actually gets sketched out on the back of beer coasters sitting there. And I imagine one of them going, you know, I've been here for three years now, and I still can't get this thing transformed. The other one goes, why don't you just shoot the damn thing? And then from there, the whole thing develops. You didn't know that's how science actually happens. Right? Honeybees now, becoming a major model organism, because now we can get into really complex things like communication, behavior, neurobiology, ecology, evolution. Now, Dr. Davis... He's head of neurobiology at Scripps. Now, he works with Drosophila. He studies memory and learning. He trains fruit flies the way Pavlov trains dogs. But he can look now at the genes and see what genes are involved and try to work out those neural pathways. And then the mouse, um, probably the closest mammalian model that we have mainly primates are a little bit better, but they're really expensive and difficult to work with and such. So a lot of human work, can't, disease work and that will be done in mouse models. Uh, surprisingly, zebrafish, these little fish that you can get at the pet store, uh, a very important transgenic animal model for development. We won't talk about it too much except in one of the later chapters. Um, so just kind of giving you a quick, just as we go through these lectures, I'll give you dates, all right? Do you have to know the dates for the exam? Sure, you have to. No, <laughs> okay? But it's, it's context, all right? Because there's things I'm going to, I'll tell you that people thought, for instance, genes are encoded in DNA, right? Well, up until the late 1940s, that was not what scientists thought. The predominant idea was that proteins would encode the genetic material. Then there were, we'll talk about a, a series of some landmark experiments that just absolutely proved that DNA has to be the genetic material. So there are things we will tell you now that may get disproved later on. Does anybody know what I mean by junk DNA in the human genome? Okay, Francis, yes? Nope. Those are part of it, but about 95, yes? Yes. So way back in the 1960s, 
in some very primitive experiments by today's standards, it looked like about 95% of the human genome was just leftover pieces of DNA that were maybe from transposons and many of them were, there's a sequence called the ALU1 sequence that's repeated a million plus times. And so this term junk DNA was used. And that's what I was taught and that's what I taught students all the way up until about three years ago. And because of high throughput sequencing now, there was a collaboration between about 20 labs called the EDGE Project. They've now done detailed analysis of that junk DNA and it looks like it encodes about 4 million little microRNAs that are involved in gene regulation. So the junk DNA now it looks like it may be more likely that 95% of our genome functions to regulate the expression of the other 5%. So these ideas keep changing with time. Okay, so we'll start with Mendel. He published his work on the pea plants way back in 1866. It went un unappreciated for about 30 years. Chromosomes really started to work those out in the early 1900s. Morgan came in with flies same time. So the, really the traditional genetics is starting to get going about the early 1900s. Um, as I said, it was really at the biochemical and molecular level, it was viruses and bacteria that predominated all the way through uh, the 1900s up until the 1970s when molecular cloning became available. Then there was now a tractable way to get into the human genome and these other complex genomes. Uh, the genetic code was all worked out in the 1960s, some really important work done at that time. Um, so it was recombinant DNA in the 70s that really got things going, learning how to do DNA sequencing. Sanger won his second Nobel Prize for DNA sequencing. The polymerase chain reaction I mentioned earlier, I call it a watershed technology. Basically between that and the sequencing of these genomes, made all the technology I learned as a graduate student, a postdoc, and probably my first 15 years or more here at FAU is now obsolete. So I'll have to put all of that into some history of molecular biology course now. The Human Genome Project was initiated in 1990. Uh, the first full DNA sequence of, uh, these are just some of the other bacteria like yeast was sequenced in 1996 and just just to kind of in that sort of late 1990s, early 2000s, sequencing at a high throughput pace where the technology was all fully automated, high throughput, the computers could handle the data, the internet's getting to be in a workable state. All of this data started coming into these databases. So now what we have is we've reached a point, okay, the first human genome was the sequencing of the first human genome was the equivalent of sequencing six human genomes. And it cost six billion dollars. It took 13 years. Dr. Narayanan told me you know, a few months ago that he had his genome sequenced for a thousand dollars. It's in the database, but he won't give me the reference number. Okay. <laughs> so it's, this is, for those of you who are looking at medicine and health areas, I think this is going to be a tremendous impact on personalized medicine genetic counseling, that you can get to this information. It is so cheap. Does anybody know how to sequence DNA? No? Let's say you're a grad student in my lab and you need to sequence a piece of DNA. How do you sequence it? You put it? Yes. I'm sorry, what? Okay, but let's say you have the DNA in hand. So you've purified the DNA. Now you want the DNA sequence of it. Does anybody know the chemistry? Could you do that experiment? Is there any need to do that experiment? Where I'm going with this is I used, see this is what you're not going to have to learn. I used to go through all the chemistry for DNA sequencing. But now you simply put it in a small test tube and you bring it to my office. I drop it off at FedEx on my way home this evening. And in two days I'll get an email from a company that says here's the link to your data. Okay. It is a outsourced process that is just too cheap to even try to do. I have thousands of dollars worth of equipment in my laboratory to do it old school. I can show you if you know if you want to come see it. But it's just I can't even buy the reagents for what it costs to get it done. So you just outsource it. 
So the fact that you can do this, that you can sequence entire human genomes, there are projects such as the 2000 Human Genome Project where they're taking, if you really want to know what genes are involved in cardiovascular disease, you need genetic information from a large group of people who have the disease and a large group who don't because who knows how many different genes are involved in that. So this is now called meta-analysis where you're actually analyzing the genetics of hundreds if not thousands of genomes simultaneously. This is really where genetics is going today and how it will affect you. Uh, the other is, up until 10, 15 years ago, it really wasn't practical to study more than one or two genes at a time. It just technically, it would be a nightmare to go any further than that. But as I said, a lot of these diseases that affect a significant number of individuals are going to be very complex and are going to involve lots of different genes. Well, now what's a pretty standard technology is microarray analysis. So kind of building on the computer chip technology, these are little micro dots of DNA imprinted on glass and then are screened and it, it, Affymetrix owns the patent on it. But the, right now the technology is there. You can screen the expression of the entire human genome in a single experiment. So you can literally see how tens of thousands of genes are changing expression. So the tools are getting so much better now. Okay. When I was a graduate student many, many years ago, I had friends who worked in mammalian genetics, and it's like, I don't, why would you do this? It's just too complicated. Just beat your head against the wall, and you'll make more progress. All right? <laughs> to go into human genetics, you had to be out of your mind. Not anymore. The human genome is now highly accessible. There's lots of very good tools for it. And I think you're really just on the cusp of seeing this impact, let's say, at the level of healthcare and how physicians, genetic counselors,